こんにちは。私はジャッジ・ジョハンソンです。感情のブレインメカニズムを研究している脳科学者です。カリフォルニアのビーチタウン・センタクルーズのハイスクールに通いました。優秀な学生ではなく、サーフィンばかりしていました。しかし、サーフィンは自立心や恐怖を乗り越える方法を教えてくれました。陸と広い海の気を変えの冷たい水の上で静けさと友情を見つけました。これはよくサーフィンを知った怖くてエクサイティングなスティーマーレーンです。サンフランシスコでは、マイサンカイにサーフィングを教えました。カイ君は私より勉強が好きでよかったです。<笑>ではあ、どうして悪ガキサーファーから研究者になったのかお話しします。日本語があまり上手ではないので、英語で話します。During university, I became much more interested in intellectual pursuits, and particularly、uh, philosophy and human behavior. I'd also had experiences with friends who had, who had uh, uh, experienced、um, psychiatric disorders of emotion.、Um, so, based on these personal Uh, experiences and my own intellectual interests, I decided initially to study, study clinical psychology.、Uh, but soon I came to believe that to really help others and to understand human behavior, we needed to understand the physical and neural basis of,、uh, of emotion and experience. And because of that, I decided to study neuroscience and I completed a PhD in Los Angeles, followed by a postdoctoral fellowship in New York City. In 2011, I started my lab here uh, uh, studying the, the neural basis of emotion, learning, and, and memory.、Uh, and I came here for a number of reasons, both professional and personal.、Uh, the first was that.、Um, Riken at that time and, and even now is, was a particularly exciting place to start a lab because we were hiring many junior faculty and there was a push towards internationalization. And it was really a place that was buzzing with energy and fresh ideas, and I wanted to be a part of that. I also had personal reasons.、Uh, my wife is, is、uh, Japanese, and we wanted our children to be closer to their, to their Japanese family. So,、uh, so, for these reasons, I decided to move here.、Um, you, can see that, uh, you can see my lab as it has grown and changed throughout the years.、Uh, but the one constant has been the international makeup of the lab members.、Uh, I, I really believe that diversity of individuals and ideas makes for strong science and society. So, getting back to the topic at hand, what I really love about the brain is that it makes us who we are. All of our experiences and thoughts and actions are mediated by the brain. And emotion is the secret sauce that gives our experiences color and meaning. Can you think of strong emotional experiences or memories that you may have? Joy, fear, love, sadness, the birth of a child. Passing your university entrance exams, hiding in fear under a desk during a strong earthquake, all of those experiences define who we are. But sometimes emotions can go wrong. And this can happen when the systems of emotions become overloaded, and it can lead to things like anxiety and trauma related disorders that are really debil debilitating for individuals. So, what are, the, what are the brain mechanisms that give rise to our complex feelings? And what happens in the brain to produce emotional dysfunction underlying psychiatric disease? The answer lies in brain circuits. Brain circuits are the functional unit of the nervous system. They are connected groups of cells that serve specific functions. 
For example, there's one neural circuit from our skin up into our brain, our forebrain, that allows for somatosensation. It starts with touch receptors on our skin that then connect to other receptors in our, or cells in our spinal cord that ultimately connect with the somatosensory cortex up in here that allow us to feel touch and pain. And there are other neural circuits starting from the motor cortex that allow us to act on the world. Neurons here project down to, the, to a different region of the spinal cord and from there out to our musculature to allow us to move. And we understand a great deal about the, uh, the neural systems that mediate sensation and motor action. But what about the neural circuits of emotion? We understand much less about this, but we and others are starting to make headway, particularly in understanding the negative or aversive aspects of emotion. So what do I mean by emotions? Emotions range from reactions, simple reactions, to more complex evaluations. Uh, for example, uh, if you're in the woods and a bear comes running at you, or you're crossing the street and a car comes barreling towards you, you have very strong emotional reactions that occur that produce escape responses and changes in autonomic activity like heart rate and blood pressure increases. Um, these experiences also produce memories. So if you hear the, the, a twig breaking before the bear runs out, on, on say the next time you're hiking in the woods and you hear a rustling in the underbrush, you're likely to mount a fear response because that sound has been associated with some aversive event in the past. And while these innately aversive emotions uh, produce strong uh, responses, many of our daily emotional uh, experiences involve more complex evaluations. For example, this boy who may be scared of heights, uh, crossing this bridge could be a really terrifying experience. But if you're a rock climber, uh, crossing the bridge or even hanging from a precipitous cliff could be a thrilling experience. And so in this way, uh, we, we uh, construe and interpret the incoming information from our sensory world in the context of our individual life experience and personality, individual personalities, to decide which emotions to mount. So what do we know about how the brain uh, processes emotion? So I'll tell you a bit about what we know so far, very briefly. Uh, for innately aversive emotions, we know that areas in the back of the brain, called the brainstem, are important for producing these innate aversive responses. But most of our emotional experiences rely on emotional states that produce and support complex emotional evaluations and memories. These are occurring more in the front of the brain up in here. An area called the amygdala or hentotai forms associations between sensory stimuli in the environment, like the breaking of twigs, and aversive events, like the bear attack. And it stores these types of memories for simple forms of emotional memory. For more complex types of emotions, an area called the prefrontal cortex has been implicated, but we really don't understand as much about that. So this is a very brief overview of what we know about the neural systems of aversive emotions and unpleasant emotions specifically. But what are the discoveries that we've made in my lab? I'll share a few with you today. So um, one thing we've found is how the amygdala knows to store these memories, these aversive memories. And we were inspired by a long-standing debate in the emotion field about what causes emotional responses, say, to innately aversive events. Uh, on one side of this debate are people that argue that our emotions are triggered by the external sensory world. So seeing a dog running at us to attack or the pain of the bite. However, other theories suggest that, that our emotions don't arise from the external world, but from how our body reacts to that. So for example, we're not scared because we see a dog coming at us, we're scared because our body is running and our heart rate increases and those internal triggers are what drive our emotional responses. But resolving this debate really requires an understanding of the neural circuit basis of innately aversive emotions. And that's really the discovery we've made. So we've found that in this area, the amygdala that stores these emotional memories and, and emotional states, um, 
neurons here are processing information about both the external aversive world, say the, 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 the uh, uh, threatening stimuli or painful stimuli uh, that are coming from the outside world, but also about our body's escape reactions and internal reactions to that experience. And we've also identified a specific area in the brainstem uh, that is important for producing a f like fast escape responses, but also sends a copy of that information along with the external sensory information up to the amygdala to produce an emotional state representation there and engage the memory formation of these experiences. And by identifying this circuit, we've helped to resolve this very long-standing debate in the emotion field. So what about more complex forms of emotion? Imagine uh, that this is your neighborhood. And inside of your brain, you have an internal model of this neighborhood. You can sit in your house here and think about where the park is, for example, or where the supermarket is. And, uh, and this can be done just through visualization, right? Now imagine that you go for a, a walk in the neighborhood, and, uh, and you come into the park. And normally, this is a great experience, especially on a beautiful spring day like today. Uh, and, and you go in there, you're enjoying the trees. But it turns out this is not such a great day to be in the park. This vicious dog jumps out and attacks you, and you have this horrible experience. And as a result of this experience, you form an association between the dog and the park and this aversive event. And if you see the dog again, you're likely to be scared. And that's your amygdala working, storing these direct associations. However, you may also know where this dog lives. And if you walk by the dog's house, you're also likely to be afraid, even though the house itself has never done anything to you. So as a result of this experience in the park, your larger internal model has been altered so that you can infer, uh, you can infer emotional, necessary emotional responses in new situations that are novel. So we've actually identified where in the brain these internal models for emotional evaluations occur. And this is in an area called the medial prefrontal cortex that I alluded to briefly earlier. And uh, the cells, the brain cells in the medial prefrontal cortex, they uh, bring together aspects of the internal model, such as the dog's house and the park where the attack occurred, with the aversive experience. They bind these things together um, so that you know the association between the bad event and the things that were directly or indirectly associated with that experience. And here you can see an example of medial prefrontal cortex cells in action as they're forming these, these complex emotional evaluations. This is through a, a miniature microscope that we've implanted into the medial prefrontal cortex. And we've labeled cells here with a marker that gives off light when they are electrically active. And by looking at the activity of all the cells, we can see how the medial prefrontal cortex is forming these internal models used for, an, for emotional evaluation. So these are examples of some of the discoveries we've made in my lab. And it's really been an honor and a privilege to work with a, a, a really brilliant group of scientists in my lab at Riken uh, on these discoveries and others. Um, and while we're making a lot of headway, our ultimate goal is to be able to give back to society. And uh, through, our, through our basic research findings, what we hope is that we can help remove anxiety and trauma from those that are experiencing them, th these types of disorders, to bring color and meaning back to their lives. Most of us experience science in the classroom. And while I've shared with you today something about the work we've done and my hopes for the future of this work, uh, what I also want to get across is, is the actual practice of doing science and what I really love about this process. As scientists, we work at the frontier of knowledge. What you learn in the textbook are the fruits of scientific discovery. But being a scientist is much different. We are explorers at the edge of the unknown. Every day, we try to come up with new ideas and push beyond the safe harbors of conventional knowledge. 
this voyage of discovery and the application of our insights to the to easing of human suffering is what makes this job so incredibly rewarding and exciting. It's been a real pleasure to share my experiences of science and our discoveries along the way with you today, and I thank you for your time and attention.